I feel honored, all the more so as I didn't used to think of myself as an applied linguist. I do, I, I have followed Gal's activity with sympathy, but I do have to admit that I have a traumatic experience involving the Gal conference in 1989 in Passau, when on my way, walking to the welcome reception, I was attacked and bitten in my backside by a German shepherd dog. So instead of joining everybody else uh, in the happy reception, I ended up prone on my belly in the local hospital and they had a bit of sewing to do. I'm happy to say that uh, I, uh, this conference has relieved me from any remaining post-traumatic syndrome, so I'm very happy to be here. And come to think of it, the more I thought about my keynote, the more I listened to papers, I realized that there's much applied stuff in what I'm doing. For example, I realize now that I should have thought more about the language policy uh, with regard to the language of my paper. I automatically chose English because uh, this is uh, what's been customary in German English studies, in teaching, in giving talks at our annual German conventions for the past uh, three decades now. And uh, in Susanne Göpferich's talk yesterday, I was reminded that uh, making your undergraduate students write in English from the first term may involve a cognitive price. And uh, I would say on the whole I would be happy to pay this price, small in comparison to the gains, but there is an issue here. And the other thing is, of course, teacher training, the mainstay of most English departments um, in Germany, and over the years I have developed a probably kind of applied linguistic philosophy with regard to the place of linguistics in teacher training. Large parts of what we do in linguistics, English linguistics, are probably only marginally relevant to the classroom. Nevertheless, we keep on doing it, it's probably a good thing. There are some areas which have obvious relevance, for example, uh, learner language research, second language acquisition research would come to mind. And in between, there are some areas which I think have obvious relevance because they feed into the type of critical language awareness which any teacher must have, even though they are basically traditional core stuff, run-of-the-mill stuff in linguistics. So from my point of view, and this is where corpora come in, a foreign language or a German-speaking teacher of English in the German school system must have a definite grasp of the core facts of English structure plus the core facts of variation of the standard and non-standard levels. And then also, I'm mean, taking into account the language the students and learners come from, a kind of basic contrastive perspective is highly relevant. So I think this is, in addition to uh, solid language, uh, practical language competence, this is the non-negotiable core linguistics that teachers need and corpora do fit in. And so from that point of view, I think uh, some or, as I hope, much of what I say will have some relevance to the concerns that most of you have as priorities in their research. Okay, so this is what I'm planning to do in the next 45 or 50 minutes. Take you through a very <coughs> quick discussion of sources of linguistic data, plus the declaration of personal bias. Then a look back on 25 years of teaching with English corpora, the other half of uh, the research publishing output which Ralph so kindly mentioned in his introduction. And so take this as a kind of confessional introduction. And then in uh, items 3, 4, and 5, I'll turn to issues of uh, instructional design, planning, higher education priorities in infrastructure development, and so on. This is where Clarion obviously comes in. So first of all, I'll start with what's closest to home, Cobra and their role as powerful agents of students' empowerment in foreign language departments. Then the politics of digital infrastructure, where I see gains and losses, and generally speaking, in a period of rapid transformation, the gains is uh, what gains most attention, and the losses tend to be swept under the carpet. So, some thinking on gains to be derived from digital infrastructure in learning and teaching linguistics, then the price to pay, inevitably, with a final reflection on whether there is progress in linguistics, I hope there is, and what 
the causes are for this type of progress. So here we go then. Uh, as you all know, there are there is only a limited uh, supply of sources for data for linguistic, for linguistic analysis, and the first two sources of data are those available to everybody, including a first-year student who has had no idea of linguistics at all and is supposed to uh, pass the introduction to linguistics, which I regularly teach at the University of Freiburg. If you're a native speaker, you just know what's right and wrong through introspection, and everybody, whether they are language professionals, uh, students studying to be language professionals later on, has the capacity to anecdotally and unsystematically observe usage and pass various kinds of value judgments on the usage they observe. So that's the raw material you start with. And then of course, uh, what uh, you as a linguist have to teach in the introduction is that uh, this is different from systematic fieldwork. Uh, this is different from systematic elicitation, which of course starts in the social linguistic field and ends in the neurolinguistic lab. lab. And this is different when you use digital corpora, which give you an entirely new window on language. And I think these insights are crucial in the use of corporate teaching, which I enjoy, which I think is very profitable. This is the personal declaration of bias. Nobody can do everything. Um, my source of data over the years, my preferred source of data, has been digital corpora. My preferred theory against which to interpret corpus data is a kind of eclectic version of usage-based linguistics. And one thing which I would like to insist in full appreciation of the wonderful advances which have been made recently in quantitative and statistical approaches is that from a student perspective, typically corpus linguistics work best if you admit that there are quantitative and valid qualitative interpretive approaches to corpus data. Use corpora not just because you've got a lot of statistically profilable data, you also use corpus data because they are in some way more authentic than what, what you would collect in anecdotal observation. So if you want to mention Patron Saints, famous names, I insist on Bybee, frequency, determining linguistic structure, and Hopper, grammar emerging all the time in interaction, and this being studied from a qualitative discourse analytical interpretive perspective. Uh, the association with Clarion, um, in the frame of which I've uh, enjoyed uh, cooperating with Marburg and Hanke in, on a cooperation project, has led to the fact that some um, Clarion propaganda, publicity, information material is available back there. So pick it up if you're interested as you leave the lecture, or preferably not during but after my talk. So, I guess uh, this will give you a kind of uh, framework uh, mentioning the people who have influenced my approach to corpora. And if you want to summarize in one sentence why corpora are useful, uh, Jack Du Bois did so in 1985. He said, Grammar's code best what speakers do most. And this is really what you can find about in corpora. If you want a more recent uh, paragraph definition, my favorite would be this, language structure, which is my concern and which is not the core of applied linguistics, cannot be fully understood without situating it with respect to current theories of joint action, social cognition, conceptualization of experience, memory and learning, cultural transmission and evolution, shared knowledge and practice in communities and uh, practice in communities and demographic processes in human history. So, believing in that, I guess there is a place for me in some way at uh, Gala. Because the only thing I haven't heard you people talk about is demographic processes in human history, but everything else when we learn interaction has been very prominent. Okay, so my personal look back. I started, I stumbled into corpora when it was still possible to enter the field on the ground floor in the mid-1980s. 
And in some way, I was fortunate in doing so because I happened to jump on a bandwagon which was constantly picking up speed and I wasn't even aware of the piece of uh, tremendous luck which I had uh, getting on early. And everybody can tell you what fantastic progress uh, there has been in the development of hardware, storage and processing. I mean, I remember running a concordance, a fairly simple thing on a one million corpus, going for lunch and then coming back after lunch and the screen telling me insufficient storage uh, program terminating. I mean, these days, this wouldn't happen with 500 millions of words. Uh, I mentioned uh, advances in corpus size and software, increasing uh, sophistical, uh, statistical sophistication uh, to the extent that I keep learning from my doctoral students all these wonderful new techniques which I wasn't aware of. One great thing, the bigger the data, the body of data, the more important visualization becomes. I'll show an example later on. And then, last but not least, the web, which has changed the metaphors, which we are talking about when we do corpus linguistics, as um, Maristella Gatto has so aptly put it, from the body of the corpus to the web. So rather than one body of data, we now have a constellation, a web of digital language resources, which are incredibly rich. So, Everybody knows that, and uh, since I'm a believer in Cobra, I feel entitled to mention at least the mixed blessings. And I see a problem in increasingly complicated annotation schemes. First of all, when you teach Cobra, use them in the classroom, because ideally you don't want to um, uh, spend half the term teaching highly complicated annotation schemes to students. Also, all the more so, as very often these annotation, uh, annotation schemes were designed for purposes which are not relevant to the particular class. And always there is the additional problem that any annotation scheme has a hidden explanation, a hidden analysis, a hidden theory built into it and so I generally find myself advocating dual use. Use the part of speech annotation, but then go back to the plain text, for example, or in the spoken language, use the transcription, but don't believe in the transcription. Go back to the audio file, kind of basic methodological uh, insight, which I think is part of the critical language awareness, which especially teachers would profit from. Then, Sadly, and I'm partly to blame, you mentioned, both mentioned uh, the ice corpus. Um, there has been one area where, unfortunately, there has been widespread regression rather than progress, and that's the treatment of spoken language in mainstream corpus linguistics. There are exceptions, but the general way English language corpora treat the spoken language, treat discourse, treat interaction, is really uh, regressive, as I'm going to show, and part of the reason is probably the ideology, the ideology of quantity. The more data you have, the better, and especially if you research a spoken language when the question arises, uh, quantity is not all, sophistication of transcription and so on may be more relevant. So what do I mean when I mention the idiomatic phrase, reducing speech to writing? Look at this. This is vintage survey of English usage paperwork, which probably was uh, lovingly transcribed, maybe even by David Crystal when he was a, a researcher at the survey of English usage. And the aim is a tape recording audio file is to be rendered in orthographic prosodic transcription. Obviously, I haven't got the time to work out all the symbols, but you see it's a very rich very nuanced, very elegant way of reducing speech to writing. And I guess when they did that, the people who produced that always had headphones on and switched back and forth between the transcription and the audio, which is not typically the way the modern corpus researcher on spoken language would proceed. After computerization, the London Lund corpus, the English service people in the audience will know that, it's spread down, but still recognizable. And this is what I did uh, when I did Ice Jamaica. 
you have one turn and every interruption is sort of some, in, a, in a summary fashion listed at the end. And the only excuse I have is that uh, I was just following orders and uh, <laughs> these were the project guidelines and uh, couldn't be helped. But people who didn't have to follow orders and have done great corpus linguistic work and have done a great service to the English studies community by making corpora accessible freely through the web, Mark Davis, unfortunately believe in quantity and for them spoken language is really um, this. You can't listen to the original unless you're extremely lucky and some, uh, it's usually in spoken media data, talk shows and stuff, and uh, if you're extremely lucky, somebody has provided a YouTube video of this particular passage and you can listen to it, but usually you can't. Uh, I tell students, uh, you want to look at how wanna and gonna are grammaticalizing, so have a look at how they co-occur and find instances of gonna wanna. And of course you will find instances of gonna wanna in this huge corpus of contemporary American English, but whether this was actually pronounced as gonna wanna, or just transcribed as gonna wanna, or more likely whether many other instances of going to want to should have been transcribed like this, there's no way of telling. We don't know who transcribed, we don't know the guidelines. We just delude ourselves into thinking that this is spoken American English. So then, what are my own contributions to this field of corpus linguistics, corpus development, generally small corpora? The Brown family was um, a, uh, an individual, the Brown corpus, one million words of American English, then the late Jeff Leach had uh, the excellent idea of compiling an actual British corpus, so you had uh, a two-member family, uh, the kind of minimal format, and as I was doing work comparing present-day British American English in Freiburg in the 90s based on corpora from the 1960s, it was beginning to dawn on me that this was pretense. And so I decided to have uh, two further matching corpora compiled to allow for the first time real-time investigation into change in present-day standard written English, integrating regional variation, British American, style variation, you have many different solicit genres, and diachronic variation. Uh, this became a great hit with the students. They generally enjoyed working with uh, this four-member Brown family, which has now grown to, uh, depending on how you count, up to nine members, because it empowered them. It gave them independent evidence beyond what was written down in the reference manuals and beyond what their native speaking lector told them was good English or wasn't good English. So you see, their inferiority complex, dual inferiority complex. I can't do better than the reference works. I can't do better than Mrs. X or Mr. Y, who is from Britain and the US and who are teaching me uh, English language competence. And uh, so I said, well, you can, you can investigate change, and it was usually fairly simple. Take, and here we come to prescriptivism and descriptivism again, so this was not organized, but uh, just coincidence. Uh, a value judgment. You have variation, standardization always means the suppression of optional variation in language, and if you have in your data different from, different than, and different to, obviously not all three can be right and mean the same thing and have the same stylistic sociolinguistic values. Uh, you haven't uh, got to seek very far to find wonderfully prescriptive statements. Within a few years, the abominable phrase different than has spread through the country like pestilence. In my own Indiana, where the words of English undefiled are jealously guarded, the infection has awakened the general alarm. You would think of this grammatical innovation as Ebola fever, but um, it's not quite as bad. And if you show students this and say that this is based on native speaker observation, and that native speaker observation always or only ever sees very rapid, dramatic, catastrophic change, and never slow and gradual change, that the unusual, the new, is always exaggerated, the routine, the conventional, the old, is not even noticed. They start to develop the kind of critical 
awareness of the double issues of native speaker privilege superiority in the teaching environment and of course of descriptivism and prescriptivism. Now, uh, I dread this slide coming up because I really hate to say uh, critical things about Peter Trotgill and Jennifer Jenkins in that order. Uh, the comparative adjective different is usually followed by from, or sometimes too in English English, while in US English it is more usually followed by than. Remember this, complicated statement, but it tries to be descriptive. Jennifer Jenkins, the comparative adjective different is followed by than in US English and by from, or more recently too, in English English. Would any undergraduate ever question this authority? <laughs> so remember this. Look at this. Figures are incredibly small. But what's the message which stares you in the face? <laughs> what is regionally specific, what is controversial, is an extreme minority. It exists but it's incredibly infrequent, and the whole English-speaking world, world agrees in preferring different from. Look at various spoken corpora, and you see an entirely different thing. So, the message is style. It's not about region. It's not about good and bad. It's just about style. And so, in one little exercise, I mean, I'm overdoing it now a little bit, you have laid to rest the looming specter of the all-knowing native speaker, and you have started a debate on genre and style and appropriateness, where there was right and wrong and prescriptive and descriptive pitted against uh, in any kind of order. What can you do with Jamaican English? It's of course uh, great because students always have uh, Although many students have a great weakness for reggae music and a favorable disposition towards aspects of Caribbean culture. So you can sneak the linguistics in. And you point out that in Ice Jamaica they have a funny way of referring to people. But what you find is that the persons who are, I mean, everybody else in the English speaking world wants people here. Whereas if you value, if you value the person friendship, and you think the person is somebody, blah, blah. There's even a very formal English word, which you don't want here. Somebody would be more appropriate. And you have the missing inflection, which is a kind of Creole, Jamaican Creole, popular language, uh, influence on the standard English, which was sampled in the corpus. Pretty solid evidence. And again, in 10 minutes, with no uh, really complications, You've laid the foundation for a discussion of formality, archaism, possible grammaticalization, because after all, person is one of those uh, chains of grammaticalization which ultimately may give you an indefinite pronoun. And uh, the students can do original work at a rather high level, which is what I mean by empowerment. Then my latest venture, which is not ready to show to the public in the sense that I can give away a corpus, is computer media communication in post-colonial diasporic web forums. That's a mouthful, so forget about it. Uh, I'm just trying to boast following the um, philosophy of quantity, which I just derided. But what I'm interested in is that territorial boundaries between dialects, boundaries between varieties of English, and uh, even boundaries between languages are disappearing fast in the world of computer-mediated communication. So, there used to be a time when Creoles were marginal, spoken on those islands where they, where they originated, where African-American English was the community language of lower-class African-American English, and where Nigerian English was combined, combined, com confined to um, Nigeria largely. These days, through migration on the ground, and even more so through language use on the web, you have everything turning up everywhere. I just think <coughs> this is a Nigerian resident in America using Nigerian pidgin, which is blue, using standard English, which is black, and using African-American English, which is red. 
So no time to work out the details, but you see that the boundaries between non-standard varieties are becoming weaker, that generally there is a loosening of the link between language, community and territory. Many of these non-standard languages become resources, even commodities. What I say about languages is also true. On the streets of Paris, in the French-speaking hip-hop community, blacks would refer to themselves not as le noir, but as black. Je suis le seul black, you see. On the web, the racial terminology by Cameroonian French speakers is generally English. This is a feature which is related to the Confranglais urban vernacular and it's even highly creative because YTZ is certainly not a word which, to my knowledge, is in current use anywhere in the English speaking world. And this is where visualization comes in because, in a very crude mechanism, in which we try to draw the dialect map of cyberspace, and which students also love, you can do a number of analysis, and you can see that the Jamaican Forum, which we are investigating, use of Jamaican Creole internationally, is really international, but not global. It's basically a thing in which the Jamaican heartland is relatively weak, and which most of the action is going on along the U.S. Sea, the Eastern Seaboard and in Canada in the major immigration centers for Caribbean immigrants. What is interesting is that the old diaspora in London is practically dead in cyberspace. In this community of practice, British speakers are not involved to any significant extent. This is the same thing for Nigeria. And you can see you can see that unlike the Jamaican Forum, the Nigerian Forum has a heart which beats in Africa still and has got two centers in North America and in Britain. A different kind of post-colonial situation leading to different kind of language attitudes, different kind of language use, different kind of multilingual practices. This is the French-speaking Cameroonian corpus, which obviously has the extraterritorial heart in Paris, France, but also a significant contributors community in North America. You can also do gender and territory at the same time. So if you have gray, you haven't got gender information for the, the particular participants. But generally speaking, the message is clear. In the Nigerian diasporic community in the United Arab Emirates, we have an overwhelmingly blue male group of contributors. In Nigeria itself, women's access to this forum seems to be restricted. And the only region where you have full gender parity, more or less, is the United States of America. So in the argument which I put forward recently, or just a few minutes ago, combine quantitative and qualitative data, I would say this is the second half of the cycle. Look at some promising data to see whether there's anything of linguistic interest happening. Then do the rough quantitative groundwork. Don't look at all the 17,000 participants. Most of them are freaks and don't contribute regularly. <laughs> look at the 500, 600, 700 people who keep the forum going. Try to find out as much as you can. Use visualization to help your thinking and then go back to the data. So the full cycle doesn't stop here with a couple of nice pictures. The full cycle is going back and got to look at what women do with their linguistic resources in the US and how this differs from the type of woman who contributes from Nigeria and so on. Now, summarizing all this, corpora, as I hope to have shown, are a great way of student empowerment in a foreign language context. They emancipate the non-native speaking researcher student against the native speaker and against the research literature and the reference works. And this is great. And they also help establish a collaborative learning and subsequently research environment because people get used to sharing their insights obtained on the same kind of database. And doing terrible injustice to Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg address, I tried to summarize this as uh, not as he did government uh, 
of the uh, people, by the people, for the people, but digital language resources of the community, by, for the community and by the community. Uh, somewhat flippantly, you could ask, how do you teach an old dog a new trick? You can't. I, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with corpus linguistic progress as well as I can, but you've got too much to do um, as a professor. So the hope is the younger generation, and the only thing you can do from a certain age is not to stand in their way, except maybe physically, because I don't want to step down. So much can be made of a linguist if he's called young. And if you want to put the envisaged changes in research culture, which I'm describing, into practice, you have to remember that they are utopian when you talk about people like me. The only tagger I've ever used systematically is uh, the clause tagger, which I've used over the decades with the Lancaster people. And uh, at Clarine presentations, I'm singing the praises of Weblicht, uh, the Clarin uh, tagger, which is no doubt a great tool, but quite honestly, I'm not going to learn another tagger because I know the uh, dangers of um, claws and I know how, uh, where you can rely on claws and where you can't. But if you want to tag a difficult corpus, like a kind of hybrid uh, CMC corpus, uh, you don't want to introduce another Com uh, complication through having to learn and get used to a new tagger unless somebody really uh, promises you, which they usually can't, that it works better than clause on this particular material. So, practical advice, which I would give based on my experience, we need systematic integration of COBRA and uh, digital language resources into undergraduate teaching in linguistics. I take this to be self-evident, but I would go further and say, increasingly, this is also useful in literature and cultural studies. I'm using Lion Literature Online, tremendous database, for studies in language history. Literary historians use it for other purposes. Why not use the same resource cooperatively? being aware of what each other is doing. Old Bailey, court transcripts digitized by historians, now made in, into a linguistic diachronic corpus by Marius Huber from the university, I have to say this, Gieson, your sister institution, but I'm, I have no doubt that you cooperate. Um, does it have to be this way? If historians and linguists if it's designed in the right way, could access the same resources, more or less through the same interface, and thereby could learn about each other's work. Another important point is teacher training. I occasionally do in-service training for teachers in Freiburg and uh, the surroundings on two topics. English as a world language, because that is a great uh, textbook thing in Baden-Württemberg. It has been for a number of years now and grammar. And I find that I didn't used to be asked to talk about the teaching of grammar, but it's getting more popular. There seems to be some kind of demand for orientation among teachers, and the package they get from me is corpus-based approaches to grammar. And I'm usually horrified by the low level of use of digital resources by the teachers. Everybody uses Google to settle every question that there is. I mean, if they're unsure about whether something is right and wrong, if they do a Google search, if they get 700 for one option for possibility two, and uh, 70,000 for the other option, depending if it's a sort of scared, timid teacher, they will not correct, I have no possibility to improve, because it's a test 700 times. If they are a teacher approaching retirement, they will say, go with the flow. As a foreign learner, you write what 70,000 people write, and what 7,000 people write. So that level of sophistication is really primitive given what wonderful corpora are freely available in English on the web. You can do the same thing on one of Mark Davis's corpora and you can achieve a much more differentiated picture, for example, with regard to spoken written differences and so on. So the philosophy of Google Plus 
fostered in the classroom, fostered in teaching practice. And uh, yeah, I'm repeating myself, um, in teacher training, democratic and participatory research communities are of course also an ideal. Which brings me participatory and democracy, brings me to the politics of digital infrastructure and again, with all due subjectivity, this is a list of my heroes in corpus linguistics. They, to me, represent the human face of English corpus linguistics and I would describe all of them as volunteers, scholar activists and <coughs> visionaries. Some of them were a bit eccentric, but I will not mention which ones were. <laughs> I mean, you have, at the start of it all, in the heyday of generative transformational grammar in the United States, W. Nelson Francis, a dialectologist, uh, launched the one million word brown corpus, providing a design plan for future activities. Jeffrey Leach, Steve Johansson. Then the first defender of the bigger is better philosophy, John Sinclair, co built uh, Bank of English. Randolph Quirk had the idea for the British National Corpus, which set uh, new standards in quantity and quality. And more recently, Mark Davis, who's basically a single person operator or an organizer of a small team and uh, has wonderful corpus architecture, uh, usually works with very large corpora and believes in the, philo in the philosophy of making things freely available to a global research community. So this is the substrate which we need. This is what we have to deal with increasingly and as a scholar based in the academic ivory tower of course you're very often in the defensive. The corporate big players there are two kinds there are the people who charge someone else and give you the stuff for free like Google and there are the people who charge your university library and where you as a professor have to think about whether the OED subscription is worth it but obviously given David's uh, praise of the thesaurus last night, it is. And then there are the publicly funded strategy initiatives, which are great because they mean well for all of us, Clarion, Daria and so on. But there is one problem. Uh, Clarion D has a worldwide research agenda, but a German funder. The EU projects deal with global issues, but on the European Union level, and usually are a bit late in comparison both to the individual scholar visionaries and the commercial developers. What can you say, what good can you say about um, uh, the Google type commercial provider? It's free and easy to use, but you need to be aware that it's fairly opaque and in some instances also transient. So Google Ngrams is a great thing which many people will have used and I use regularly, but they're endangered languages problem. The uh, Endangered Languages Project has come and gone. So no long-term perspective. Emerging with great fanfare, but then disappearing. What can I say to the commercial providers? I admire the quality of the work that's gone into Literature Online, the Lion Database, the whole of English literature since the beginning of the print era, almost to the First World War. Uh, OED Online, nothing needs to be said. And the only thing you can say, please don't raise your prices anymore so that we can still afford you your service in the future. Digital infrastructure for the humanities, what are the pitfalls? Research follows infrastructure. There is a danger of that in corpus linguistics, which is very real. Just because there is a corpus of something and some variety and a new way of counting something, people start doing it and then they leave it at that. And again, not mentioning specific examples, you can come across volumes in which this kind of half-finished research is published and you ask yourself, so what? I mean, we now know how much of it there is in the text, but we don't know enough about the reasons. Research questions are sometimes dictated by infrastructure options and the relatively bad treatment that's spoken language has received in corpus linguistics in the early days, I hope it's improving, is due to this dynamic. If you have 
more storage, you go for more words, and the easiest type of more words is more newspapers into the corpus, and then you have another 500 million newspaper corpus, but you still have very few corpora of spoken face-to-face -face interaction. I, working with Clarin, I suppose everybody who works in this context um, realizes that there is a translation problem, the developers have their priorities, the users have other uh, priorities, it's very difficult to communicate this um, among the two communities. And if you're involved in departmental administration, for even a, an English department which is considered fairly rich and well endowed, like our department in Freiburg, about whose financial situation I'm generally happy, it is an issue where the money comes from to pay for our OED subscription. And uh, I do have to report user statistics to the authorities in order to justify the expense. Why is it still worth it? I'm now trying, coming to the end of my presentation, to roll everything into one sort of final summary. Looking back at what Cobra have done for me, what digital language infrastructure has done to me, I would say that in those cases where I was able to use the resources intelligently, it was a path from mere information to knowledge and insight. But of course, this transformation has to be achieved in the analysis. I have also personally appreciated that widespread access to corporate resources stimulates cooperation, exchange of data, exchange of results, and a kind of cooperative research culture which moves the field forward. And the younger generation will make things even better. So, what about progress in linguistics? My three final words. I take this from a recent presentation by Valentin Werner, who is doing a study on the English perfect, not that there aren't any, but he's doing another one. And in the introduction to his presentation, he says that there's a kind of rhetorical gambit which makes you really desperate. The guy who wrote his monograph on the present perfect in the 1970s said, for Gregarius, the perfect has always been a somewhat inconvenient case. Uh, the guy who wrote his monograph in 2009 wrote, there's a very rich literature on the English perfect, but one cannot say that there is a generally accepted analysis. Now, if I can't write, this is 39 years of concerted effort by the numerous group of English linguists working on the perfect to solve the puzzle, but they haven't got very far. No doubt these books are worth reading, but the problem really is, can you explain this to a physicist? Is this progress? I know uh, there is progress in linguistics, and linguistics in 1960 was totally different, and we are doing many things much better today. But the question is, why? And I was encouraged, and as probably you don't know, you saw David Crystal give five points, uh, apparently for, as a reward for the generous treatment we were given by the organizers, we have to do five-point videos. And so my video, which is going to come out tomorrow, apparently, is five reasons of linguistic progress. So it had to be five, and I hope you'll be happy with my five. <laughs> there are the individual geniuses whom everybody knows about. Desaussure, and Chomsky, and others, of course. And I guess with Desaussure, you can't say he was a marketing talent, because he died before his success became apparent. <laughs> Chomsky uh, enjoyed his success in his lifetime, and long may he live. So, conceptual innovation, redefining rules. I mean, these are all the terms. But then there is another source which uh, modest people like you and me can feel some optimism about. There is also genuine crowd intelligence in the community. Because in my paradigm, usage-based linguistics, you can't trace everything back, back to one founding father or one founding figure. There are many founding figures. I showed you a slide naming some of them. And these people cooperated, collaborated, and they produced uh, a new term, and I suppose um, Pragmatics uh, has some known innovators, but on the whole, you wouldn't say Pragmatics was invented by X, like Generativism was invented by Chomsky, or launched by Chomsky, would say it's a crowd intelligence phenomenon. So that's number two. Because it had to be five, I thought about the context, and I think linguistics 
sometimes needs to be given a boost, or as Americans might say, a kick in the ass. Um, <laughs> and for a long time, we rested safe in our alliance with literature and culture. You could do literary language, you could do statistics, great stuff. It fit in well, by the way, with teacher education. Teacher trainees love that kind of thing. But these days, we are rethinking our alliances and one new alliance, which is strong and becoming stronger, is with psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics. And I guess we'll see the benefit and the progress, maybe not tomorrow, but certainly in 20 years' time. In the academic ivory tower, as this will be the gal reason for progress, uh, applied linguistics, what does society want linguists to do? Historical comparative linguistics is one of the great success stories of linguistics in the 19th century. And the reason authorities were willing to fund research in linguistics, found all those university departments which most of us work for, were certainly teacher training, the practical reason, but then also a social consensus, romantic nationalism, then later more vicious kinds of nationalism, that vernacular languages and their history deserved study. You cannot derive justification for linguistic research from that today. And uh, you have to think about where in an increasingly multilingual society the social coalitions might be built which would support linguistic research from outside the university. And then finally, technology. Which kind of linguistics couldn't we do with recording equipment? The moment there was recording equipment, people started using it for linguistic research. This is prisoners of war from Britain, dialect speakers, kept in prisoner of war camps in Berlin during the First World War. The Berlin uh, professors went there and recorded these people, produced the first dialect recordings. We can do better now, as we know. And so I would say, digital revolution, Cobra have made it possible in brief words that we can, we're not cleverer than people in the 19th century, but we can ask questions which they didn't ask because they would have wasted five or six years to answer them. With the way we can handle digital data very often, we can try out what people would have shied away from because we have the luxury of wasting a couple of hours in the afternoon to see whether the corporate solution is benefits or not. So this is where I see you, can, you don't need more than paper and pencil to become a structuralist. You do need a mobile recording device to become a good sociolinguist and to become a state-of-the-art usage-based linguist. You need a whole lot of partly expensive digital infrastructure. So, what are the conclusions? How should we teach linguistics? We should systematically teach them basic statistics and IT programming skills, the thing which I was never able to learn when I was a student. But we should also teach them that sophistication in linguistics is never only statistical. Count what counts. Language is not a bag of words, but a complex network of constructions. And data-driven theorizing should always be interrelated with concept-driven corpus analysis. Cobra provide the data. For me, corpus linguistics is my method and usage-based linguistics is my theory. If people feel similar, promote serious empirical research into how students use digital resource resources because then we move from speculation to a study of what people are really doing. Encourage discussion on how digital infrastructures impact on research topics and research practice. And if that culture is in place, then some of our graduates might have less to worry about about where to go after they have taken their degrees, because this is also a new field for employment. So thank you very much.